he um, um, and he said that when he went, he went to Estonia in '92 after the Soviet Union fell. Uh, but even when he, even then, when he was there, they took his passport and kept it the entire time he was in Estonia. So it made him a bit nervous. Um, so anyway, so that was my interaction with Bill, and he said he would be happy to talk with me again, uh, and that he would, uh, and that he would love a visit once everything uh, opens back up. So anyway, this is the book I was talking about. This is what I had sent Sarah, and I have not made a video yet for you. So this is called The Chronicles of Henry of Livonia. So Henry, so this was written by Henry uh, in 1232, 1228. Um, and it chronicles the, what was going on back then was that you had um, this, this, the, it wasn't the Catholic Church, it was just the church, because there was no Catholics at that point, or Protestant, there were no Protestants at that point. Um, but you had the church in Germany concerned about what was going on in the you know, Northern Europe, in the Baltic area. They were mostly pagans, still, in uh, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, and Estonia. And they felt like this was a logical place to go up and crusade. Uh, part of the issue was as they were trying to establish churches in Lithuania, uh, the first bishops that went up uh, were treated rudely in that uh, one of them, in fact, was killed um, and pulled into little bitty bits uh, and thrown into the river. So um, they got a little more militant in their response. And there was one bishop named Bishop Albert so this was all with the dispensation of the Pope, who his goal was to go up all the way up to what it wasn't called Tallinn at that time. It was called um, Raval and, um, and see if he could uh, convert these people. Now, they wanted to make an actual crusade out of it. So what they did is they needed muscle. So they got the Danish army. Um, the Danes were led by King Valdemar II. Uh, and they essentially went up and started kicking butt and taking names. Now, Henry, uh, he's pretty even-handed in this, in, in, in talking about um, the Latvians and, and, you know, the Estonians of the time. Um, but still, he was writing from the perspective of, of the church and of a crusader uh, and felt that, of course, the church was right in, in what they did. So, um, the... Um, so anyway, so he was writing this, uh, so he wrote this, this long book. And really, in that part of the world at that time, this was about the only thing that they had that we have now to tell us about what was going on then. Um, so now you can imagine how um, Estonian nationalists or Latvian nationalists feel about that. So... If you want to be, if you want to have national pride or cultural pride, it's hard when all you have is this to tell you about your people because all of their people are made out to be pagans, unorganized, uh, savage, you know, use whatever the negative epithets you want to use. So, um, so it's interesting. So anyway, so what, what I found is I found this book. Uh, crusading and chronicle writing of the medieval Baltic frontier. So what this is, is this is actually a series of papers and lectures that were presented at a conference in 2011 in Tallinn. Um, oh, let me go back to this one real quick. So the reason I was so interested in this book is because this actually has an account of the Battle of Livonia, uh, the Battle of, what do they call it? The Battle of Lindenese in 1219, which was when they actually were invading what then was, like I said, it wasn't called Tallinn yet. Um, and during this battle, um, the Danes are being uh, repulsed um, and the pagan Estonians are winning the day. And the bishop, this is the, the myth, right? The bishop you know, says this prayer and, and the heavens open and, and down from the heavens falls the this banner 
of a red field that had a red field with a white cross on it, which is the flag of Denmark. Not e even today, it's the flag of Denmark. Um, and that uh, the 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 belief is that um, that God was now showing them favor. God was on their side. And they were actually able to rally and win the day and take over uh, and take over Lindenese, which was what that uh, Dompia, which is where that you know that domed part of that that plateau inside of Old Town, that's called Dompia. Um, that was called Lindenese at one point. And, um, and they were able to take that over. Um, and the, and again, the myth is, and this is what all Danish children learned, is that that banner that came out of the heavens is now the, was the Danish flag. And, and they actually ad adopted it soon after, and it's been the Danish flag ever since. So interesting story. Um, makes you wonder what really happened. Was it was it the wily Bishop Albert who, uh, you know, conspired with a couple of guys to have this banner somehow drop from on high and have it come floating down? I don't know, uh, but I've got some ideas. Anyway, so, um, so anyway, so, so these Estonian nationals want something other than the Chronicles of Henry of Livonia to refer to. And so there's an interesting there's an interesting part in in one of these essays, and it says, let me read this. The first manifest construction of Estonian history, however, was the national epic Kalevipoeg, uh, by Friedrich Reinhold Kreutzwald, a writer and a leading figure of the nationalist movement. It is a tale about the waning of a golden age that ends with the arrival of iron men on Estonian shores, and thus provides an allegory of crusade. Um, so both epics longed for a golden age and stressed the violence of conquest. And these features also remain central to the tradition of national historic writing established in the mid 19th century. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to reframe this time period, not as this time period of pagans and savages and, um, you know, that needed settling and modernizing and, and converting, but a, but a golden age that was ruined by these invaders. Again, I mean, I'm sure I know this, all this sounds familiar. This is not a new, this is not a new idea with Estonia. I mean, you know, it's, I'm sure you get the same thing. I'm sure there are Welsh, Welsh nationalists who believe that, you know, before the British or before the Saxons or before the Normans, whoever it was that invaded or before the Romans, that that Wales was this paradise that was ruined. Um, and and so anyway, so that's it's this is a really interesting book because it gives a lot of commentary about the Chronicles of Henry of Livonia. So uh, and then I've also been reading another book. Here it is. Uh, and this is one that Bill Rebene had recommended and it's called Graves Without Crosses. Now, do you remember when I was at the Museum of Occupations? I made a video about that. And I think I talked about the Force Brothers or the Force Brethren. They were the they were the these men who during World War II lived out in the forest of Estonia and essentially fought a guerrilla war um, against the Germans, then continued on after World War II against the Soviets. So this is a book about the guy who wrote it was actually one of those Forrest brothers. And it's about that time period, uh, about these people who are fighting against these occupations. Um, anyway, that's, this is long. I'm so sorry. We're like at 23 minutes already. So I know I had a lot to tell you. Um, anyway, so that's why I sent you that movie, not just so you could see boobs. Um, but it's, it ties into this whole idea, uh, of this, of what I think is really interesting stuff. And I would love to share this more with Sarah, um, and talk more about this and this. Um, and Duncan hopefully is sending me the Kalavipo egg. And, and there's actually, I, I got to tell you one more thing before I wrap this up. And that is um, in the Kalivala, so in the Kalivala, this, that's the Finnish saga, you've got Vainamoinen. Um, oh God, where is it? I got it right here. So you've got Vainamoinen who is the hero, the Kalevala. And what happened is you've got um, the god of the underworld stole the sun, right? Stole the sun and the moon 
and hid them away. So Uko, Uko, I think, is the god of the heavens, the god of the sky with his light blue stockings. I love that phrase. Creates the spark for a new sun from his sword and a rock. And, um, and then... Um, and then he placed that spark in a silver casket and he bade the maiden rock it, told the maiden of air to rock it that a new moon might be fashioned and a new sun may be constructed. On the long cloud's edge she sat, uh, on the air sat the maiden, and there it was she rocked the fire, there she rocked the glowing brightness in a golden cradle with a silver cord she rocked it. But what happens is she screws up somehow and... And she, and she rocks the fire to brightness and her fingers moved in her hands and she dropped it. And she dropped the flame, the careless maiden. From her hands, the fire dropped downward from the fingers of its guardian. Then the sky was cleft asunder and all the air was filled with windows, burst asunder by the fire sparks as the red drop quick descended and a gap gleamed forth in heaven as it through the clouds dropped downward through nine heavens, through six spangled vaults of heaven, and it impacted the earth. And then Vinamoinen says to his brother, let's go and perchance discover where this fire descended, where it's fallen, and see if we can get it and bring it back into the heavens. So, so they are in um, a place in this part of the saga called Karelia, which is like far eastern uh, Finland, near, like, almost kind of right down the border with Russia. So where they went is they went in the direction of Estonia. It went in the direction of this island, because where they found, they found this spark that had fallen out of the heavens and struck the earth on this island off the coast of Estonia. Now, what's interesting is there's an island called Saarema, um, which is this massive island, S-A-A-R-E-E-M-A, -E -E off the coast of Estonia. It's like the largest island of the thousand-some-odd islands off the coast of Estonia, and it's inhabited. And on this large island, there's an impact crater called the Kali Crater, K-A-A-L-I. You can look, look this up on the internet, um, Kali Crater. And it's an impact crater that's about 100 meters in diameter. And they believe that this crater, that this occurred, you know, I don't know how they, they know, but they know, somewhere like 1500 to 2000 BC is when they think this up. And it struck with the force of like the Hiroshima bomb and probably for six miles, so a 12 mile diameter flattened every and incinerated everything. So the idea is this, 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 these historians, these literary historians over there, think that this actual cosmological cosmic event, this, this meteor that fell and, and impacted on Sarema, actually is where the, where the ancient peoples in this area got this part of the story that became the Kalevala. So... It's really cool to think that Vainamoinen and his brother went out and ended up in Sarema to find this spark of the sun that had fallen through the heavens and impacted. Uh, you know, it's just a cool idea. So, um, God, I'm almost at 30 minutes. So I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you for listening. If you, if you find any of that of interest at all, let me know. We'll talk about it in much greater length. Uh, I hope you are well. Uh, by the way... I did cancel our tickets next month uh, to come to Washington, but now I have vouchers that I can use anytime. Um, so let's wait until things cool down and I'll see if I can get out there. Um, I hope you're well. Um, and that's my story. Sticking to it.